So in this video, we'll be talking about the types of receptors that uh, neurotransmitters act on. There are two classes of receptors. When a neurotransmitter is released, it binds to a receptor. And there are two general classes of receptor proteins that each have different effects. So you can have an ionotropic receptor. Um, and this is the receptor that we've primarily been talking about so far. It's a binding site for a neurotransmitter and it turns in, it, this inotropic receptor becomes a pore that regulates ion flow to directly and rapidly change membrane voltage. So this is what would let in uh, positive ions such as sodium, potassium, and calcium to cross the membrane. Uh, it's usually excitatory and the goal is to trigger an action potential. Okay, so here's an example of an ionotropic receptor. Um, before the neurotransmitter attaches, it's closed. Once the neurotransmitter attaches, then the pore opens to allow the influx or efflux of ions. A metatropic receptor on the, has a very different uh, reaction to neurotransmitters. Metatropic receptors indirectly produce changes in nearby ion channels or they, they start a chain of reactions or secondary messengers that affect a cell's metabolic activity. Metatropic receptors involve a G protein. This G protein consists of three subunits, alpha, beta, and gamma. An alpha subunit detaches when a neurotransmitter binds to the G protein. This detached alpha subunit binds to other proteins within the cell membrane or within the cytoplasm of the cell to cause one of a series of reactions. Uh, one, the alpha subunit can alter ion flow in a membrane channel by indirectly affecting a nearby ion channel. The detached alpha can also influence the formation of new ion channels. Okay. If a cell wanted to be able to release more neurotransmitters or be, become more responsive to neurotransmitters, then if it forms new ion channels, then it has the potential to, really, to let in more sodium or, more, or, re, or remove more potassium as part of the action potential process. The alpha subunit can also cause downstream effects um, to travel to other parts of the cell to result in the production of new proteins through DNA. So basically this means that this alpha subunit can be detached and travel elsewhere to say like, okay, look, I want you to produce this new protein that you haven't done before, or I want you, and this new protein can then have uh, a whole different sort of cascading effect on, on behavior. It can result in the forming of uh, a new transmitter. It can, uh, a wide range of effects on your body. You can also, in general, have an amplification cascade, an escalating sequence of events downstream. The production of new proteins through DNA can also result in the change of expression of existing genes. So these proteins can go in and try to activate dormant genes that can then cause the synthesis of additional proteins. So these metatropic receptors are really important for changing how a cell will function. So here's an example of how you can have a uh, G protein that can um, indirectly result in the opening of an ion channel. So the transmitter binds to receptors and this G protein here um, it triggers this activation and the alpha subunit is released. Okay, um, It binds to a channel causing a structural change in that channel that allows ions to pass through it. Okay, so this is just, uh, this is the, um, uh, the way that the G protein can uh, cause, again, an influx of um, sodium or an efflux of potassium. But then the second messenger, sort of the cascading or alternate effects, are visible here. So you can have the transmitter 
that can bind, again, to the G protein. The alpha subunit is released, and it then uh, interacts here with another enzyme, and it can function as a second messenger. So the combination of this enzyme and the alpha protein, second messenger, can then form new ion channels, so it can actually give instructions to make new ion channels, or it can activate DNA. So in this way, these metatrophic receptors have the potential to change the makeup of the neuron and the, the structure. They can change um, the number of ion channels there are, uh, the number of autoreceptors there are. So this can cause, so this is really important for causing structural changes in a cell. These are videos that I will post online for you to watch as additional resources. This one is um, quite short, so you can go watch these at your leisure. In continuing our discussion of receptors, it is important to again note that no one neurotransmitter is associated with a single receptor type. So just as no uh, one tr uh, neurotransmitter is associated with excitatory inhibitory, no one neurotransmitter is associated with a particular receptor. So for example, a neuron may bind to an ionotropic receptor and have an excitatory effect on the target cell, or it can bind to a metatropic receptor and have an inhibitory effect. The nervous system and our cellular makeup is on the whole designed to be very, very flexible. For an example of this interplay of how a neurotransmitter can do multiple things, acetylcholine activates ionotropic receptors on muscles for excitation, but it activates metatropic receptors on the heart to inhibit it and slow down. Continuing in this same uh, line of thought, a single neuron can use one transmitter at one synapse and a different transmitter at a different synapse. Different transmitters may also coexist in the same terminal or synapse. So all of this reminds us that we, we don't want to make the assumption of a simple cause and effect relationship between a neurotransmitter and behavior. A neurotransmitter can be both excitatory and inhibitory, and they can have different activation and or structural effects on a cell. So here's an example of a neurotransmitter within the somatic nervous system. The cholinergic neuron is a neuron that uses acetylcholine as its main neurotransmitter. This excites skeletal muscles to, to cause contractions. Nicotine ACH receptor, when this ACH or nicotine binds to this receptor, its pore opens to permit ion flow, thus depolarizing the muscle fibers. So here you have two different types of effects. And continuing along this line, in the autonomic nervous system, cholinergic neurons from the central nervous system control both divisions of the peripheral nervous system. So within the PNS, CNS uses acetylcholine to activate sympathetic fight or flight response to activate neuropinephrine. The CNS also uses acetylcholine to activate the parasympathetic, the rest and digest, then to activate acetylcholine. So here we have the same neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, that is actually used to activate opposite ends of the peripheral nervous system. The sympathetic, which is involved in fight or flight, or the parasympathetic, which is actually involved in rest and digest. And these two compete against each other. Sympathetic will downplay the parasympathetic, and the parasympathetic will um, try to downplay the sympathetic. And yet they both use acetylcholine. Here's an example. So the sympathetic division, here you have acetylcholine. The acetylcholine is going to cause the activation of neuroepinephrine, which gets the body ready. In this parasympathetic, however, acetylcholine is going to result in activation of acetylcholine use will result in more acetylcholine activation to promote rest and digest. So now you should have a bit of a broader understanding of how you can have multiple types of neurotransmitters. We have small molecule neurotransmitters or transmitters, you have peptide transmitters, and you have transmitter gases, and there are multiple types of receptors for each. And 
you need to understand, well, there are different types of neurotransmitters, and here's what there are. And there are different types of receptors, and here's what there are. And how do you distinguish some of these neurotransmitters, and how do you distinguish some of the receptors? You'll be learning more about different systems of neurotransmitters in the next video.